So thank you very much, and thank you for the last speaker. Uh, so I'm going to talk about in silico models uh, this afternoon to support uh, decision making. Um, just to put it into perspective, um, one of the ambitions we have here at LASA is to work towards the elimination of animal studies uh, without any compromise to safety. So clearly within the cosmetic sector, we're kind of already there, uh, but quite a lot of our work is towards the pharmaceutical sector, and that's a little bit behind in terms of uh, eliminating animal studies. But we think it's achievable. Uh, and I want to share a slide with you, which is um, a little bit optimistic, uh, but I want to talk about how I see the future of of safety toxicology. So I'm going to do that one slide and then I'm going to talk about in silico methods and how they can be used to support safety decisions. So here's my kind of slightly controversial slide. Um, it's a prediction of the future, so it's going to be wrong, uh, but at least it's a starting point. So starting from the left hand side, you can see where we are now in that, um, particularly in the pharma sector, animal studies are pretty routine, uh, as are in vitro studies and in silico is fairly supportive across a fairly small number of defined endpoints. But flipping forward to around 2030, I can see that um, in silico becomes more um, widespread. In vitro, it becomes pretty comprehensive. It can start then to inform the selection of any animal studies uh, rather than having them routine. So you start making targeted animal studies. Uh, and then moving forward a bit further, um, I think then we should get to the point where in silico is pretty comprehensive. And that can then be used to target in vitro studies. Uh, and the only time animal studies would be needed at all would be to confirm. Uh, and then by 2040, uh, I reckon we shouldn't be needing animal studies at all. And in silico, we we're pretty well accepted. And in vitro will be more confirmatory. So in vitro could just be an in vitro, it could be um, organ, organ on a chip or animal on a chip. And this kind of aligns with where the EPA is in terms of the statement that came out from uh, Andrew Wheeler uh, back end of last year, which is looking towards the elimination of mammal studies by 2035. So I think that seems reasonably consistent. So in order to get to that, that future world then where in silico and in vitro is all you'll need to make good decisions about uh, human safety without requiring any animal studies, what do we need to do? So in, in terms of in silico, I'm going to describe the rest of my talk in terms of uh, bronze, silver and gold. Uh, and so uh, I've, I've laid these out here on the left hand side. Um, I think bronze uh, in Sineco can inform a, a study design. Um, and so here you may not be able to stop using animals, um, but you might be able to reduce the number that are, are being used. And so reducing the animal burden is, is a way of going forward. Uh, but getting better um, in Sineco uh, could be enough to identify when the study is needed. Uh, and maybe in vitro and in silico will then be sufficient to make a decision, a decision that's not only safe, but also regulatory accepted. And again, I want to emphasize that this is particularly challenging within the pharma sector, where at the moment uh, animal studies are obligatory. Uh, okay, so at, at, at the silver level in silico um, wouldn't be enough on its own. Uh, and so the gold, the aspiration of, of, of LASA is to produce models which are sufficient and accepted within a regulatory framework and a safety framework uh, in, in decision making. And again, I think there are kind of two layers here. It's, it's easier to accept a positive prediction from an in silico model uh, because that means just stop and don't go anymore, uh, positive meaning toxic. Uh, it's more difficult to accept a negative prediction from in silico because there's still that element of risk. You're saying, I don't know of any reason but is there anything that's not known by the models? So to give examples of each of these, uh, let me work my way through. Oops, i the wrong way, sorry. Um, so bronze then, so better study design. Uh, so that might be the uh, elimination of a second species. Um, it might be the use of um, historic data to make better choices about how to design the study. And that will result in uh, smaller study sizes. And an area which uh, Lars is active in at the moment within uh, an EU project, uh, eTransafe, is looking at the use of virtual control animals. And a publication just came out a couple of weeks ago where we've laid out that concept of not needing control animals um, in, in animal studies because there's enough data from historic control animals in order to make those good comparisons. It's actually bronze. Uh, silver. Uh, this is this combination of 
in vitro and in silico and that being sufficient uh, to make a decision without the need for animals and I've just put up here uh, a paper that came out last year um, where in vitro and in silico in, in conjunction was used to make decisions about uh, the risk of skin sensitization to a human uh, and the reason this is interesting because there's been quite a lot of effort to look at different combinations of assays that can be used to make decisions about skin sensitization uh, without using animals uh, and quite a lot of those analyses were run lots of assays and take the majority vote or take a conservative view if any one of those assays is positive uh, then consider that as a positive prediction uh, but that's quite time consuming and quite costly uh, and in silico can help uh, and the and the approach presented here shows that an in silico model can understand the strengths and weaknesses the gaps and the sensitivities of different assays and based upon the chemical understand which of those assays is the most useful to making a prediction and that can then be confirmed with one or two uh, in vitro assays so it's a more efficient way of working uh, and this workflow ended up with uh, very high accuracy but of course what we want to get to is to the gold level the accepting a prediction without the need to do any animal studies uh, here it's much more challenging yeah so it requires uh, a model that's trusted it requires a lot of supporting data uh, in other words if you're going to defend or um, make a decision and justify it uh, you need an awful lot of supporting information uh, and knowledge uh, and data in order to get to that point where you can comfortably stand up and say I believe this is a safe decision and often that hinges around having data and having a mechanistic rationale and the screenshot on the right hand side is Derek Nexus where all of that information is composed within a knowledge base and a prediction is made and information that provides uh, analogues and a mechanistic rationale and an expert commentary and references allows a, a conclusion to be drawn. This is relatively easy to uh, accept if you want to be conservative and an alert is fired which says this might be toxic in this case mutagen uh, in which case you say I don't want to expose it to a human so therefore the risk to the end end human uh, is relatively low. This becomes more difficult with a negative prediction uh, because here there's a level of uncertainty that's left. Again there's a, a lot of work that's been done in this area and I highlight a couple of papers uh, where quite a lot of the science behind making predictions for a negative and being able to accept those uh, has, has been, uh, been uh, worked through. Uh, more recently, we've published a paper around uh, redefining applicability domains. Uh, so uh, the early definitions of applicability domains were uh, quite varied in the way in which they've been interpreted and lots of different ways of uh, trying to define the applicability domain of a model has been put forward, which means that if you look at two different in silico models, they may say it's within or outside of the domain and use completely different methodologies and different questions in order to make that assessment. Uh, and so the, the, the approach we've put forward is that actually you need to divide the problem of applicability domain into three separate questions. Firstly, whether the query compound is within the mechanistic range of the, uh, the model. If it isn't, then it's not appropriate. Uh, you also need to understand how reliable you need to be uh, with a model. So how much uncertainty or how much error can you accept in a model and that's captured in this concept called a reliability domain and finally the last part is um, what we've termed the decidability domain which is can I make a clear decision so if the model's coming back and saying well some compounds are active and some compounds are inactive then it's pretty hard to make a clear decision unless you have a, uh, a clear rationale as to why you should dismiss some of those compounds in order to draw a conclusion it's much easier if all the compounds which are uh, considered relevant or similar uh, or either active or inactive but these concepts about how do I look at data and look at models in order to make a decision are really important and I think there's still further advances to be made before negative predictions can be well accepted for in silico models so where next do in silico models have to go before we get to this point where they can make decisions which are trustworthy have enough confidence and enough supporting data in order to make a good model and I've got a couple of slides where I want to take you through where I think some of those gaps are and where Lars is progressing into the future so in order for those models to be accepted they must be accurate 
Uh, they must have a very high level of accuracy, uh, but fundamentally they must be transparent because in the end, the end user has to look at the output, understand the data that went in, the knowledge that went in, uh, the approach that's used, uh, and, and understand exactly how to, to process that information. So transparency is really important. <laughs> uh, fundamentally, these models have to be built with an understanding of toxicity. Um, historically, in silica models have had a pretty bad um, uh, reputation, uh, primarily for um, bad models, uh, models which are based purely on looking for correlations. And as we all know, once you look at data sets, correlations can be really distorting in terms of what you, you see in a model prediction. Fundamentally, a model must be built with an understanding of the mechanism and what's important for that toxicity so that we're not looking at correlation anymore, we're looking at causation. Uh, in order to achieve that, it, there's, there's a need to learn from all available data. Uh, and we know from experience that if we build models purely from public data, it is insufficient to make really robust models in many cases. Uh, and so one of the challenges which we've taken up is to build methodologies which allow us to learn from proprietary data sets and without revealing any of the underlying data, transfer that knowledge from proprietary data into a, into a model. Uh, and this slide here shows EFRIS, which is a consortia led uh, product we're developing within LASA, where you can see on the left-hand side some of the performance. So each of these models in blue, A, B, C, all the way through to H, are models built on proprietary data sets. The knowledge that each of these models have deduced was used to then train the student model, which is in green, which shows better predictive performance than any one of the individual data sets. And this is really important. What it says is that I can build strong models by working in a consortium and those models be better than any one company's model by itself uh, and this information was published in, a, in, a, in an article uh, for, for HERG, one of the uh, um, iron chambers on the heart at the end of last year. So building models with uh, large amounts of data that are built around an understanding of toxicity is one of those key steps but still that's not quite enough to make good decisions. The other half is understanding how those models relate to the toxic outcome. And, and here's another consortium led product that Lazar is developing called Captis. And here we're, we're linking together uh, biological mechanisms for toxicity through adverse outcome pathways. And so it's uh, illustrating here, it's showing uh, how interaction with uh, an estrogen receptor uh, results in downstream effects in first the cell and then in organs all the way through to uh, the whole animal or whole human. And linking these together allows their models to predict uh, activity against a receptor, the uh, molecular initiating event, and understanding the consequences downstream as you move through more biological complexity as to what that results in an adverse outcome for uh, an overall um, animal or a human. So these two pieces are vitally important, the ability to build models on uh, primary endpoints for which there are large data sets available uh, and linking those primary endpoints, those high throughput assays through to the consequences in a whole animal study. So building models purely on animal data or human data would not be uh, sufficient. Uh, there's too many causes of toxicity, there's too many different mechanistic pathways and there's insufficient data. And so I think these two steps are absolutely crucial if we get to get to that uh, gold standard of in silica models being used to replace animal studies. So, so in summary, in silico models, we'll play an increasingly critical part in risk assessment. We're seeing it adopted in a variety of ICH guidelines. Uh, and so in silico is now becoming uh, accepted within the regulatory domain. Uh, and in the short term, we're working hard to reduce the number of animals needed to uh, make a determination of human risk. Um, for example, through virtual con control groups. Um, and are also reducing the number of animal studies by identifying how better to design uh, uh, animal studies uh, when you don't need to do them, when in vitro alternatives are sufficient, and in those cases, which in vitro assay is the most useful for making a decision for your particular chemical. So it's not about running batteries of assays and saying, if I run enough assays, I'm sure I'll find something. Uh, it's about being smart about it and understanding the biology and the mechanism and the sensitivities and specificities of individual assays and saying this is the one which is most useful for determination. The challenges are huge though. Um, uh, we, we don't believe this is possible for any one organization to do, whether that's a farmer 
or, or a model building organization um, and it has to be through collaboration and so collaboration of data sharing collaboration of the knowledge to understand biological pathways is crucially important and Lars is right at the forefront here with and I give you an illustration with with two products there so I'm going to close now and say that Lazar is a not-for-profit educational charity that works across a range of different organizations building predictive software and sharing data both with industry and with regulators. Thank you very much.